All right, here we go. There we are. Folks, thank you so, so much for tuning in this evening. My name is Katrina and I uh, work for the Toadstool Bookshop. I'm the events coordinator in Keene, but we have locations in Keene, Peterborough, and Nashua. Um, we are here this evening for a conversation with PJ O'Rourke and Rick Broussard of uh, Hampshire Magazine. And I'm so, so excited to welcome these gentlemen here. Um, folks, we're here today for PJ's book, um, A Cry from the Far Middle, Dispatches from a Divided Land. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, please stop by the Toadstool. We're all open. We would all love to see you in the store with your masks on. Um, or you can visit our website at toadbooks.com and check it out there. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you two gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Yeah, thanks, Katrina. Um, PJ, it's, it's great to see you in this, uh, in this, great to weird, see you, Rick. this weird world, in this this weird media that we're that we're meeting each other here in. Yes. Um, are you... Yeah. Do, do you do a lot of zooming or is this is this well i i have been doing a lot of zooming around I, I've, I've got to say it's all been a little odd to me i'm uh i'm um an analog person living in a digital digital age yes right yeah you know, I, I i thought it was funny that this is your 20th book uh and it's it's coming out in 2020 mm. was that coincidence no, or timing? <laughs> yeah, no, there was no planning and uh I, and i want absolutely no blame for 2020 thank you <laughs> the, the, so you're not you're not branding it in any way good no 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 um i i, I suspect most people who are, are tuned in know you or know of you if not they, they they'll learn shortly but i thought i would uh, we'd actually had a i had my my publisher i was kissing up to my publisher so i let him uh, write a story on you that appears in a current issue of our magazine, and and he he introduces you in a way I thought was was good enough just to read. Um, he says, for those who po whose politics lean left or work as a political satirist who appears frequently on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. For those who lean right, he's a political satirist who writes for the conservative magazine, The Weekly Standard. For the moderates reading this, he's written in all sorts of general interest magazines, including Car and Driver, Forbes, House and Garden. And of course, he mentions your Rolling Stone credentials as you were, you know, foreign affairs editor, and you were the editor in chief of National Lampoon, which is where I fell in love with you. But then a fact that I wasn't aware of, you collaborated on the screenplay for the 1983 Rodney Dangerfield movie Easy Money. And I, you know, I just, I have to assume you're, you know, um, you're still, you know, you're, you're staying busy uh, with all of that. I, uh, and, and of course, I, the American Consequences. You're an editor of uh, an online. Uh, magazine of some note, and um, are you working on any other movie scripts? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm fortunately free of that. Um, but uh, uh, no, I don't think that. Um, uh, it's one thing about uh, uh, writing, uh, partly I guess because it's a compulsion, but mostly because you don't make any money doing it. Is that you never retire? You know, um, or one never retires, and, and so you know on. On I go, I'm gonna keep at it. I've got to say that the American political system has been very generous in giving me things to write about. And I just, oh, I, I wanna thank, wanna thank the deep state. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually that's a great uh, cue because I, I know you wanna, you wanna read a little bit to uh, us from your, your current book. Uh, and I think that um, the, some of the ironies of the, of the age are really embedded right in the very publishing project uh, that you undertook. So maybe you could read a little bit from one of your many prefaces to a project. Yeah, yeah. And, because events kept overtaking me as I was writing this book, but I, I will speak to that here. Um, <clears throat> what this country needs is fewer people who know what this country needs. Uh, we would be better off, in my opinion, without so many opinions, especially without so many political opinions, including my own. Our nation faces a multitude of difficult, puzzling, and abstruse problems, but no politician has the guts to say, I don't know what to do about them. No politician even has the guts to say, I don't know what abstruse means. You know, our economy has been upended by the technological changes that they make the whole industrial revolution look like James Watt putting a bigger tea kettle on the stove, you know, I mean, our second gilded age that we're going through right now with its golden pathways across 
across the ether. A gold brick when it comes to crumbling roads and rackety public transport and just decaying bridges, corroding water pipes and collapsing sewers. A soaring economy has left shocking deprivation in the midst of ridiculous luxury. Uh, a click on a website can now get you anything except a living wage. Meanwhile, we're undergoing these social changes that are so swift and profound uh, that they'd send the best cultural anthropologists fleeing. I mean, Margaret Mead would be hiding out in Samoa, hoping like heck to study something as uncomplicated as teenagers, you know. Uh, the tic-tac-toe of Cold War diplomacy has given way to so these foreign policy conundrums uh, of sort of tri-dimensional chess like Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock played on a Starship Enterprise, except the, except the pawns have nukes. Uh, transformations in healthcare have turned the, the historically cheapest part of being alive, dying, uh, in, in, into something so expensive that people can't afford to do it. Uh, and surviving Americans are left trying to weigh the balance between having a life worth living and, and having a planet that can support life. And yet, America's political ideologies, of which we currently have three, left, right, and insane, with considerable overlap between the third and the other two, the political ide ideologies that claim to have all the answers, and this just can't be true. We need to bring the wishy and the washy back together, along with the namby and the pamby, the milk and the toast, and that way, America can have a mild, calm, milk toast atmosphere in Washington uh, where issues are thoroughly examined and politely debated and where maybe occasionally, anything could happen, a wise thought is had. Uh, you know, we may be on different sides of the fence, but let's make that fence top wider and, and, and better padded and then go sit on it, you know? You know, I may be of conservative ilk and you may be of liberal stripe, but this doesn't keep us from having friendly discussions. I mean, should the government be laissez or should the government be fair? Uh, we're all in favor of peace, but when the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard lie down with the kid, how often are we going to have to replace those sheep and goats? Um, does Medicare for all mean that young people have to wear trifocals and depends and trade their bicycles for portable folding walkers? Uh, if political campaigns are funded by taxpayer dollars, do, do taxpayers have 90 days to return politicians for a full refund? And will the politicians still have to be in their original packaging? Um, that's what my book is about, or that's what it was meant to be about. Then. While the book was being edited and typeset, somebody ate an undercooked bat in a Wuhan wet market. Panic and pandemic ensued. The nation was brought to a stay-at-home standstill. Um, it's like being 16 again, a friend of mine said. Um, uh, uh, gas is cheap and I'm grounded. Um, then with everybody cooped up, going crazy and going broke, some fuss budget with a loose mutt in Central Park calls 9-11. There's an African-American man threatening my life after she'd been admonished by a Harvard-educated bird watcher, who, if video is anything to go by, is the very picture of a Harvard-educated bird watcher. Now, on that same day is that Central Park display of American inclusiveness and mutual respect, members of the Minneapolis police force decided to take a knee on the neck of George Floyd. After nearly nine minutes of suffocation in agony, Floyd died. He was accused of spending $20 in the form of a banknote that had no actual value. Congress is currently spending billions of dollars in the form of banknotes that have no actual value. Would the police employ the same bigotry and violence on Congress? No. The police would employ, employ bigotry and violence on people protesting the bigotry and violence of the police. Chaos cried out its appeal. The thievish and the vandalistic are friends of chaos. When their friend called, they came. 
The President of the United States appealed for peace, understanding, and unity. And a behind he had to, uh, waddled down to his bunker hidey hole under the White House and urged the U.S. military to invade their own country. Then he talked trash and went to church, which he could use, attacking thousands of nonviolent demonstrators to get to church. Not a very Christian way of going to church. And that's where things stood as this book made its socially distancing and peacefully protesting way to the printer. Uh, you know, there are people competent to make judgments on COVID-19. Um, I'm not one of them, didn't go to med school, couldn't have got into, couldn't have got into med school, couldn't have got into veterinary school for goldfish, you know, flush twice and call me in the morning. Um, there are, I suppose, people competent to make judgments on the social upheavals accompanying this pandemic. I'm not one of those people either. I'm an old guy. And I'm just left wondering whether my book is now completely beside the point. I mean, will American politics be changed by the pandemic? Will Americans emerge from their health crisis, their lockdown isolation, their economic collapse, their material deprivation? Will, will Americans emerge with a newly calm, pragmatic, and reasonable attitude toward our political system? Will our, our reawakened awareness of systemic prejudice cause us to critically analyze and democratically restrain our civil institutions? Will we abandon the factional hysterias and histrionics of the early 21st century in favor of a policy, uh, a polity, a polity in favor of a polity based upon competence, on, upon civil discourse, upon goodwill? Or having had time alone to dwell on our grievances and our affronts, Will we revert to our petty arguments and our stupid partisan tiffs? Will we maybe even return to our spiteful quarreling with renewed vigor? Because this is, this is often how, how human nature works. Um, and I'm betting that human nature will triumph over adversity and challenge. And I don't mean that in a good way. So that's my little reading summation of the book. Yeah. <laughs> All your, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you gave an interview with Reason Magazine uh, a, a few years ago or a couple of years ago that w before the, most of the incidents that inspired yeah. the preface and the pre preface took place. And, and you referred to politics as poisonous and poisonously boring. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, I assume that you're referring to that just in the sense that, you know, I, I mean, it, when the game has no rules, it's just not interesting, you know? Right. And, Imagine a football field with no end zone, you know, no markers, no rules, no teams, you know, and, or people constantly changing teams or four or five teams on the field at the time. Yes. Games yeah. without rules are uninteresting. I think that interview may have taken place before it became evident that Trump was going to be the Republican candidate, let alone the president, because Oh. You, you got to give him points for interesting. I <laughs> detest him as one may, and, and I do. Um, um, he, he, he does to keep things lively. And I wish they would get boring again, please. Yeah, well, and that's the problem, isn't it? Is that, I mean, moderation sounds appealing now, but, you know, it is boring. I mean, you think of the candidates that, that were known. I mean, what, what Walter, Walter Mondale, uh, you know, who, yeah. who are the moderate candidates that even made it to the you know, to the election, you know, to the to the big runoff that we're about no, to experience. No, we we want a little spark. We want a little excitement in 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 our politics, and I think maybe we should rethink that. Maybe there's something going for the dull guy. I don't say that as an endorsement of Biden because I, I'm not. Um, uh, Biden has been um, on that playing field I, forever. I mean, he, he has been in, in, in the Senate since 19, he was elected in 1972, you know? Yikes. Uh, yeah. And, that was Nixon, and, right? Um, yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, you know, he has maybe, you know, we, we want a moderate and experienced person, that, but there may be such a thing as too much experience, but well, what are you going to do? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting segue. There, there's a, uh, because I wanted to bring up Richard Nixon because, and in the early Trump years, I was always reassuring my, my young staff members, you know, don't worry about it. We had a monster 
to, you know, when, oh, when, sure, yeah, the you know, dark lord, right? <laughs> and 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 he was, and look, there, Luke, you, know, you people, are my son, <laughs> right? Right, and um, and yet some, you know, <laughs> and and frankly, the vilification machine was, I mean, it was not as sophisticated and it, or power, you know, as loud as it is now, but it was working nonstop, even on Reagan, who's become kind of a political working, saint. working pretty hard, yeah, yeah, but you know, is yeah. Trump really that different? I mean, other than the fact that he's an outsider, is he really that much more vilifiable? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know about vilifiable in the terms of um, we we we've had some wicked and evil politicians. Um, uh, they actually haven't always been our worst politicians either. Um, um, the, it, it's, a, 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 it's a bit of a paradox. But Trump is, to me, the most frightening, not um, because of his beliefs or even his actions, really. It's just a phenomenon. The best way I can describe it, and I think anybody who's raised children in a two-story house will understand exactly what I mean here. He is a toddler at the top of the stairs. We all had that moment yeah. when we forgot to close the baby gate and we're walking through the hall and we look up the stairs and there's a toddler at the top of the stairs. Oh, oh, those are awful moments in parenting. And, you know, I, there are awful moments in being part of the electorate, too. You know, it's uh, that, that I, um, um, you know, when it comes to you can have people who are bad. And Richard Nixon was a bad guy. Uh, uh, and, and yet, you know that you can depend upon them to reliably do what is in their own best interest, which means that their actions will be predictable. Yeah. And the next best thing to people with good actions are people with predictable actions. Yeah. When you get somebody who's a complete wild card, and you know, this is just as true on the left as it is on the right. You know, I mean, this is take a world historical view on this. You know, we're not we're not just talking about conservative crazy people. The crazy people come in every flavor. Yeah, and 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 all political stripes too. Yeah, all political yeah. stripes, um, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um You you know your your argument for uh, for making put you know padding the fence so the fence sitters have a more comfortable place to sit. Uh, it 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 reminds me. I want to go back to that question. Who are the people doing that? Is there anybody trying to make moderation sexy other than you? Right. <laughs> no, and I don't think a sexy probably wouldn't even be the word. But I do want to get people thinking about it. See, I don't I don't want us to all like come together in a big group hug and sing kumbaya. What I want us to do is get back to arguing with each other on substantive grounds. And I don't even mind if the argument gets heated, but I just want the argument to be on topic. You know, there, there, is, there are a lot of arguments to be had in a great big social democratic welfare state like we live in. We are a, a social democracy, a, 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 a democratic welfare state. Don't tell uh, 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 the kids we haven't told the kids this is a welfare state, but you know, like, all modern large democracies have a social safety net aspect to them, you know, that they probably, you know, they didn't 150 years ago when there weren't hardly any democracies. Anyway, there are lots of arguments about how to, a lot of resources are required to be a big democratic um, uh, um, nation. And a lot of arguments have to be had over the allocation of those, those resources. Those resources are not unlimited. Uh, our politicians are spending as if they're unlimited, but there's ultimately they're going to run up against the, they're not going to be able to borrow enough money. They're not going to be able to tax enough money. They're not going to have enough money to do all the things that they can promise. Biggest criticism, for instance, that I have of Joe Biden is simply a quantitative uh, uh, criticism, his platform, his campaign platform is 350, excuse me, it's 567 pages long. Hmm. All right. It can't be done. I'm sorry, let's, let's stipulate every one of those ideas and promises in that giant pack of, of paper. Let's stipulate that they're all good ideas. Let's stipulate that they're all possible ideas. Let's stipulate, let's even stipulate that we should do all those things quantitatively 
it just can't happen. There is not enough, not only enough money in the world to do all that stuff, there's not enough time and energy and people in the world to do all hmm. that stuff. Maybe there's some way that uh, you can pair campaign promises or rather, rather with platforms with their fulfillment and that would endow the party with some extra vote lead on votes in the next election if they actually live up to their platform then they would be be more economical and and i I think we're so used to politicians lying to us that we never go back and say well you didn't do what you were supposed to do or only the other side does i mean you know biden will come back and say you president trump didn't do what you were promising to do and 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 trump will come back and say well you're the you and you were in the obama administration you didn't do what you promised to do and blah 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 um, but we, the voters, rarely uh, uh, keep such careful score. And you may have noticed that, I mean, I'm talking about how bad the Democratic platform is this year. And, and like I say, it's quantitatively bad. It's not so much a matter of qualitatively bad. Um, it's just an, a, a case of overpromising, wild overpromising. The Republicans, on the other hand, managed to have their convention and nominate their nominee without any platform. <laughs> Which is a little worrisome also, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, you know, what's more dangerous, the person that promises to do more than can possibly be done or the person that you, it ain't telling you what they're going to do. Yeah, you know, and so on the one hand, there's like a totally, in, uh, you know, in, um, uh, amorphous platform. The other is one that nobody will read. And, and then <laughs> yeah. and then we have so, cable news which is uh, somehow bifurcated do you, do you watch how much do you watch cable news I don't I it? watch as little as I possibly can uh, you know I read um, I read Associated Press because Associated Press is dependent on um, clients uh, of all imaginable political stripes and persuasions and therefore it's kind of a just the facts ma'am sort of operation. Um, I read the financial news because um, not not for their editorial viewpoint or for their, you know, their slant, um, even though I am, you know, free market conservative libertarian ish. um, But I read the journal and the Financial Times and the Economist because they are providing information to people who are actually going to spend money or not spend money are going to decide to allocate resources on the basis of that information. Therefore, if they turn out, if, if uh, unlike uh, uh, um, um, you know, Fox News or unlike, um, 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 what's the one that's on the left? Um, yeah, well, MSNBC or- MSNBC. Or C- okay. CNN, which is, I guess, it's supposed to be the pivot point, who knows? I guess it is, you know, I mean, I don't pay too much attention, but unlike, these other news sources, you know, if the Economist and the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal, if they're like repeatedly and provably wrong, I mean, they tell you the Dow went up 30% yesterday and the Dow went down 30% yesterday, they're gone as a business. So they have some investment, um, uh, you know, they, they, they may be as biased as the next people, but they have some investment um, in, 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 in facts because their readers use those facts. Yeah, and and yet, uh, and you, you probably know enough about these these networks to know that, of course, the, the enormous influence they have over people, and 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 I guess kind of the, um, you know, it's almost like a, a you know, it's a ha- habit or addiction. I think that that many people get into with with cable news because it starts to form yeah. the worldview. Yeah. It, it informs it. It is the sole or you know, or it, worse yet, it echoes it. You know. Um, speaking right. of addiction, you know, one, I, I will say one thing in favor of all, all this zooming around that we're doing instead of you and me being together in person at the toadstool um, with physical people in the audience. Uh, it does have one little, I'm allowed to smoke in public for the first time in like 40 years. <laughs> so, so it's not all bad, this, uh, this electronic world we live in. But no, it's true. But it, yeah, I mean, and it doesn't matter. When MSNBC or Fox News is dead wrong, it doesn't matter because the next day they're on to something and it's like nobody really used those facts. Uh, they just used those facts to to bolster the opinion that they already had. Um, they're, they're looking for affirmation. They're not looking for, um, um, they're not looking for analysis. Um, and, ugh, you know. Yeah. So I stay away from it all as much as I possibly can. 
I, 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 what puzzles me is, is how people will react when, when, when everything's over and they compare notes because they, they, are, they are so far apart. You know, I, I guess, I don't know, maybe we're able to absorb all sorts of, um, of misinformation and just like a bad dinner, you know, just excrete it somewhere psychically. But it just seems like one side Please. or the other is getting terrible information. The other side is probably just getting slightly less bad information, but they're totally different narratives. And it just seems like there's going to be a collision, a cultural collision or something on the other side of the election. Or It's worrying. It's very worrying. Yeah. Especially the immediate aftermath of the worrying. But that said, America is a, a divided country. It's always has been a divided country. Yeah. You got to think about where America came from. America is not one of these places that's united by ethnicity, united by religion, united. We're barely even re united by a common language. Uh, and, and I'm talking about English speaking people here. I'm not talking about any any new immigrants. And besides, we're all immigrants. I mean, even the people who were here originally uh, because of being defeated. Uh, and defeated, incidentally, not in battle, but defeated by disease and demography, even the people who were originally here in the United States, um, um, you know, ended up being foreigners in their own country, you know, on, 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 on the reservations and so on. And of course, they, in their turn, you know, some thousands of years ago, came from someplace else, too. But everybody came to the United States from all over the place, and they came for an amazing variety of reasons. I mean, some came here on the make you know, as a big land scam. Some came here as religious fanatics, hoping, hoping to set up a new um, sort of fanaticism, you know, wonder world of their own. Um, some came here, on the, on the other hand, ch were chased here by bigotry, by religious bigotry or, 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 or ethnic bigotry. Um, and some were, some were chased here by poverty because there simply was, I mean, that's how my family got to the United States. The O'Rourke's didn't, didn't come to the United States because they loved America. The O'Rourke's came to the United States because they were starving to death. And in fact, my family came by wagon train across Canada to work as lumberjacks in Michigan. Right. And I'll bet, you know, people say, oh, you know, uh, we, we, we shouldn't have amnesty for immigrants. I'll bet my, my, I'll bet my family didn't know what country they were in for like probably the first 10 years or so that they lived here and since they couldn't read or write. Uh, anyway, people have been, you know, and of course, let's not forget that a large portion of Americans were dragged here involuntarily as slaves. So America's been always been made up of a very diverse uh, uh, group of people who don't necessarily get along with each other very well. And we managed to get through this. I mean, we had this one little civil war thing. Uh, <laughs> that, that was not good. So that, that far. Was very not good. <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, so far we've only had, you know, people say, oh, America is so divided. We've never been that divided. And I go, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know. I, 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 I'm a child of the 60s. I'm a child of the 60s. And not only was America more divided now and more violently divided in an uglier, angrier way, but not, you know, so not only did I see that, I, in my own little personal way, caused it, you know, or as much of it as I could as a mm -hmm. little hippie kid in the 1960s. You know, I was right there in the thick of it. But forget the 1960s. What about the 1860s? You know, divided as we are, Fort Sumner isn't taking any incoming, you know, so mm -hmm. I think we'll get through this, you know. That doesn't mean that, that getting through it, uh, it's, a, I, it's a Winston Churchill quote, or at least it's attributed to Churchill, um, that I was thinking of today, which is uh, when you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> and so I think, yeah, we're going to go through a little bit of hell, but it is my hope that we will keep going. You know, it, it, a lot of what you were mentioning reminds me of this word that everybody uses now, unprecedented. You know, it's, it's, it is the word du jour, you know. And, it is, yeah, yeah, there's, there's and I, and overused. I that's not. I'm no, sure no, that. no. It's precedented. Yes. America's <laughs> precedented anger. America's right. precedented unrest. America's yeah. precedented dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction with. Well, the, well how about senate, senatorial <laughs> precedented shenanigans? I'm sorry, my dog. <laughs> yeah, yes. You know, there, there, there's very little that in, in the Senate that is really unprecedented. They just haven't <laughs> gotten around to it yet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Their worst things have been precedented than what we've seen. Yeah. Um. 
the, uh, has anything happened this year to help, you know, to cause you to reconsider any, you, you, you've been thinking the, this stuff out a long time. You had long held assumptions about the way politicians operate or, you know, political systems endure. Is, has anything changed or has it just confirmed your suspicions? Uh, no, I got to say it looks pretty much as always, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't think, uh, I think we, we, we end up being some person as, uh, I love the commentary. I love the peanut gallery there is, uh, is apparently taking umbrage at what I've got to say. Um, no, I think the political system is, is uh, you know, operates in much the same rather unattractive way that it always has. People talk about like as, as if there were more prominence of money and there may be, there may be more prominence of money per se in the um, – uh, in in politics right now, but um, in the past there were huge interest groups that influenced politics, probably more directly. For instance, the slave owning Southerners influenced everything from the Constitution right on up. Um, they may they didn't pour money into Washington. Of course, Washington didn't exist yet. They didn't pour money into Philadelphia, into the but but their influence and their presence, of course, all the way through till till 1861 was an enormous pressure on our politics and, you know, big businesses of all kinds. And for that matter, farmers, even though they, they farmers didn't have any money, they didn't contribute any money, but their vote was very important. And so their interest group, you know, all the question, all the big question of the 19th century post-Civil War was tariffs, tariffs, you know, the farmers wanted lower tariffs so they could sell their goods and so that, that, that the things they needed to buy would be inexpensive. The manufacturers wanted higher tariffs to, to prevent foreign competition. Um, and that was a huge fight in the last half of the 19th century. And, you know, that was fought, it may not have been fought with directly with this great big check writing like it is now, but uh, the essential effect was the same. What this is, this is a Zoom problem. I've been trying to quiet my dog while you and listen while you were talking. And, and she, my, my wife is parked in the, in the driveway and is upsetting her. And I, I can't call my wife in here to get the dog out. So it's a Zoom problem. <laughs> You're stuck. You're stuck. Yeah. Yuna, well, Yuna, go into the den. Go into the den. All right. Sorry. <laughs> At I least it wasn't a naked here. child in the background. <laughs> or, or a or naked adult. Worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Zoom problems. They're all, they're yeah. all our problems now. Right. Somebody was telling me the other day, I've got a friend who's, who's a, a business guy and he, who's been, you know, teleconference just constantly. And, and yes, absolutely, somebody stood up and they were, they were only dressed from the waist up and they <laughs> forgot. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not wearing shoes. So. Oh, okay. Well, that, that, that's all right. Yeah. Um, the, you know, uh, your, your experience as a war correspondent has, has to inform, you know, your view of the world in a lot of ways, because you've kind of seen the worst of things. And, um, you know, it, it, it strikes me, and I think you referenced this, that we're going through a really peaceful and prosperous century here, you know, like 20 years into probably what everybody was hoping for, you know, all along, you know, uh, we're diminishing poverty, basically human rights are improving. The, 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 the thing that, you know, the philosophers called progress and debated whether it actually existed, we seem to be actually getting it, you know, and yet we're stressed out more than ever, you know, and it's I, an I interesting know. conundrum, you know, and um, first place, who is that we that is stressed out? I mean, you're stressed out. I'm stressed out. Presumably, the people who are who are watching us um, uh, or listening to us um, are are stressed out. Is that like a middle a middle class? I mean, how about the but there is something on the order of close to a billion people that since the end of the Cold War have moved up up beyond living on less than a dollar a day. And 30 years ago, there were more than a billion people on earth living on less than a dollar a day. And okie doke, maybe a dollar buys a little bit more in Zambia than it buys here. But even so, it's not something I'd care to try. And I don't think anybody else would either. So there's been enormous progress. Um, we're 
uh, uh, we, we seem to live in a very fraught and, 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 and world with a tremendous number of conflicts in, in, in terms of major wars and the number of casualties they're in. We've been in a period of um, unusual peace by historical standards. Um, does the, you know, the opening of free trade around the world, has it caused problems? Yes, yes. I mean, China's got a rather suspect and unattractive leadership that is uh, being empowered by um, their increasing wealth. And, that, and that's a little worrisome. It's worrisome the way they treat people internally in China. It's worrisome about their intentions um, outside China. <clears throat> But it sure beats, um, you know, the, the, the starvation of 30 or 40, we don't even know, 30 or 40 million people under Mao's great leap forward. Uh, Putin is, Putin's a bad guy, but Russia is, you know, yes, they've still got nukes, but they're kind of a wasting asset. They're in a lot of demographic trouble. Uh, they're in a lot of economic trouble. Cheap oil is, uh, you know, that was the only thing they had going for them really was oil. Um, so that's a bad player that, uh, now that might drive him to some desperate acts. Maybe he has already invasion of Crimea and so on. Um, but you know, he's got a limited power. Won't keep him from trying to mess around with this election. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I... Yeah. So actually we're living in, I mean, it may not seem like it just lately and certainly, and since the pandemic started, it doesn't seem like it. But as a matter of fact, I mean, you know, there, there is, the, 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 we are able to combat this pandemic. This was not true when the, when the, when the so-called Spanish influenza struck um, right. 100 years ago. Um, we, we had no tools uh, whatsoever to, um, uh, uh, and, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, things aren't going great, but things could be going much, much worse. And back in 1919 and 1920, they, 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 they were going much worse. Right. We'd had no choice but to hunker down. And now, yeah. now at, least, at least there's, you know, that was my thought at the beginning, you know, we will science our way out of this. And well, that didn't exactly happen, but, but, it, it, but maybe it did. Maybe that's what's, what exactly what is happening. Uh, that, that was, you know, sometimes when in the, you know, in those little, uh, erroneous comments that people make is, is a lot of truth the the the, um, the comment that you know we're, that we can't we can't conquer this we're going to manage it is is something that I think is a lot of people just go yeah okay so it's a pandemic we can manage it better for sure than we are yeah. um, but but it isn't something that we're going to beat and except for through science and 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 probably and that won't happen instantly but right. but in but a hundred years ago there was no science with which to beat it, you know, exactly. and there was no, you know, the, no, no real system in play. You know, we may be managing poorly, but they weren't able to manage at all. Yeah, I, I have to throw this this question at you, because you, you mentioned in uh, you, the famous line from FDR, uh, you, in a chapter you did on inaugural addresses, in your great book that, I, that I, we should reference as often as possible. Um, yes, we should do that. Uh, <laughs> that is what I'm here for. <laughs> but the, but the, uh, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And, and that always seemed like a pretty Zen remark to me. And I loved it when you said, you know, what does that even mean? <laughs> you know, uh, it's a good question. But what do you think we do have most to fear as a country going forward into a murky future? I suppose that what worries me uh, um, uh, most is that, um, yeah, is, is to loop back to what we were talking about earlier, is it the way that the political argument has gotten out of control and become tribalized? Um, you know, when you, when you wanted to, 30, 40 years ago, if you wanted to be a nut, um, it was a lot of work. You had to go buy a mimeograph machine, get your all that mimeograph ink all over your hands, you know, and crank out your lunatic pamphlet, and hand them out on street corners. You had to carry around a soapbox to stand on, you know, to, to harangue people and carry signs and so on. It was, it was really now. Now, if you want to be a nut, just a click of the uh, click of the finger, you know, and on the internet, and no matter how wrong you are about some issue, you can find a large and enthusiastic group of people who are even wronger, and you know, you can all get together and uh, uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> and, 
and be wrong. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's become, you know, this, this tribalization of, uh, of our politics, the ease with which the internet allows us to, I actually have a chapter in a book called whose bright idea was it to put every idiot in the world in touch with every other idiot, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it, that, that, that very much concerns me. Uh, and, you know, I think we'll get through it, but I think it's going to be very hard. And it's, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of the argument to get personal and out of control. And, um, you know, it's like an argument <clears throat> that um, anybody who's been in a long-term relationship knows this kind of argument. You know, it starts out with something like, should we get the couch slip covered? And somehow that argument warms up <clears throat> and, it, and, it, and it starts getting heated. And, and pretty soon it goes from, you know, should it be floral chintz or should it be, you know, plaid corduroy <laughs> to, uh, there was that time back in 19... 96 when you were flirting with that person at a party and like I hate your mother I've never said it out loud but I hate your mother you know I, let's just get it right out there I hate your mother it, it's the kitchen sink argument you throw you end up throwing the kitchen sink at each other and it's very you know a lot of marriages and long-term partnerships and uh, relationships have fallen apart and incidentally in the process the sofa never gets a new slip cover you know? <laughs> And so when you, when you lose sight of what you're arguing for and what you're arguing about, and you start putting your energy into hating the people who oppose you, um, in, in, instead of trying to like listen to what they mean, you know, I mean, it, it, always have to go into every political argument, no matter how strongly you feel about something, uh, you have to, um, you have to go into to that argument saying, I, I will hear what you have to say. I will hear what you have to say. And um, uh, we're not, we're not listening. So it's, it's that we stop listening. Yeah. Um, what, can I ask you one quick uh, last question? I, I, this is a cliche question that all candidates, not all candidates get asked only by, by cliche ridden interviewers. So like us. Me, <laughs> I got you. Um, but it seems like given this opportunity, you know, um, uh, to ask you as a radical centrist, um, they, they usually ask the candidate, say something good about your opponent, you know, and they, they usually basically, you know, figure out a way out of that. But can you say something good about both of the, here as we're making up our minds, some of us, very few of us, maybe, well, maybe one person uh, who to vote for, um, what, what, what could you say good about both uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden uh, for the electorate on this eve of the election? You know, I honestly think that both of them say the same thing about both of them is that in their very different ways um, that they they do love their country. They really do love their country. Um, you know, it may be hard to to realize that harder, perhaps to realize that about Trump. But he does have like um, his vision for how America should behave and how America should act in the world may be very disagreeable, but it's not based on a hatred or loathing or detesting of the country at all. Uh, it's maybe based on a, um, uh, it may, may be based on, on there may, may be deep prejudices involved, there may be a sort of chauvinism involved, but, but he wants America to be a rich and prosperous safe and, 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 and uh, you know, and stable place. He has a bad way, in my opinion, of going about this. Um, <clears throat> with Biden, I, I don't think there's any question that, 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 that he loves his country. I don't think his, that statement would be controversial about Biden. Although, you know, Biden belongs to a sort of branch of politics that is inclined to be extremely critical of the United States. And it's not that we don't deserve that criticism, but you know what's most amazing about the uh, about America is what we have managed to achieve in spite of all of our faults and our flaws. And I sometimes feel that the Biden side of the equation doesn't give enough credit to America for 
I mean, we had terrible, terrible record on civil rights, and, and, and in many ways we still do, but we've accomplished an enormous amount in my lifetime. We went from a level of bigotry that's just really hard to imagine today um, to um, uh, 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 a, a protection of people's rights that was hugely hugely improved by the civil rights movement of the 1960s and of the legislation that was passed in, in, in the 1960s. And it, you know, it didn't work. Did it work perfectly? No, but it did work. Uh, and, uh, 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 and people have much great, much more equal protection under the law than they did w within living memory. So yeah, these guys, you know, that they, they, they each have their flaws and their faults and, it's a, uh, I saw a really honest yard sign the other day. Um, I, in fact, it was so honest that if it weren't for the pandemic, I would have knocked on the door and given the people a big hug. <laughs> it said, settle for Biden. <laughs> and I, you know, I was hoping, I was looking around the neighborhood and I was hoping that they maybe had some neighbor with a sign out front that said, hold your nose and vote for Trump. You know that. Uh, <laughs> then I would have really felt that I had uh, I, I I'd found my town I want to live in. But you know. <laughs> well, good signs. So yeah, thank you, PJ. It was great talking to you. It's great talking to you. It's good to see you. Yeah, hope to, hope to see you in person soon. Me too. So, Kristen, you there? So we're gonna. Yes. Uh, hi. We're going to open it back up to questions. Um, folks, just use the little chat feature. It's down the bottom of your screens. Um, if you have any questions or or would like to ask Rick or PJ anything, please feel free to ask using that. Um, again, if you haven't read this book yet, please stop by the bookstore, check it out. Toadbooks.com. If you don't want to leave your house, we'll mail it right to you. Whatever you want. <laughs> um, um, Joanne says, hi, PJ. I really enjoy and appreciate your summation of negative rights produce mostly positive effects while positive rights can have negative consequences. It's a great balance that you're hitting right there. Um, Let so me explain that. Let me explain that a little bit to people who haven't read the book um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and are going to buy it, <laughs> is to be hoped. Anyway. Uh, I, yeah, well, there's one, one chapter in here which I talk about where we get we have a tendency to get politically confused about negative rights and, and, and um, positive rights. Negative rights are our right to be left alone. I mean, if you the, the, the first um, uh, the, the, the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights is all about negative rights. It's about stuff that other people can't do to you. People can't tell you what religion to be. People can't tell you what to say or what to think. Uh, people can't put soldiers in your home um, and uh, uh, but but and positive positive rights on the other hand are right I, I think it's a very badly phrased thing positive rights are our rights to material things uh, we talk a lot about people having a right to housing a right to schooling um, a, a right to 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 food and, and, and a, a right to shelter a right to medical care I would say that those things involve a transfer of material resources. And you may have a right to those things, but that also means that somebody else is going to have money taken from them against their will, perhaps, um, to provide you with these goods and services that you say you have a right to. I would prefer for us to reframe it. Uh, it's not that I don't want people to get food and shelter and clothing and medical care. It's not that I want anybody to be uh, um, desperately poor, but I would prefer to put that in terms of, we have a duty to provide all children with an education. We have a duty to make sure everyone receives medical care. We have a duty to make sure nobody goes hungry. Um, I consider those to be more rights than duties. And it's interesting how we got to like negative rights and po positive rights, why they're called the way they're called, is that it was uh, a formulation um, um, uh, by a, 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 a German social scientist for whom English was not his first language. And I don't think he realized the, uh, uh, the, 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 the connotation 
he knew what positive and negative meant, but I don't think he realized what a positive connotation positive has and what a negative con connotation. Um, um, uh, um, uh, it was Isaiah Berlin, and, and, and the, the, the uh, um, German, German born, but lived in Britain and great, politi brilliant political thinker. But it was he who came up with this distinction between negative and positive rights that I think, you know, that, that, that confuses people a bit. Sorry if that was a long answer to a short question. All good. So uh, Rob says, if a new edition of Republican Party Reptile were to be issued and you wrote a new introduction, what might you say about the Republican Party right here, right now, today? I'm sorry, I lost you for just a moment there. If a new what? Um, if a new edition of Republican Party Reptile were to be issued, <laughs> <laughs> and you wrote a new introduction for the reissue. Uh, what might you say about the Republican Party today? Yeah, I think there would be a lot more scolding of the Republican Party today from the time that, that, that I wrote that. You know, this is probably somewhat true of both parties, but um, the Republicans in particular are much better as an opposition party. And part of that is because they take the fundamental stance. You know, I mean, America doesn't have like strictly delineated political parties. We've got a political party that basically says the government should fix this. And we've, uh, the government should fix this problem. And we've got a political party that says the government is the problem. Uh, and anybody who's been down at the DMV filling out reams and reams of stuff in order to, 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 to register a trash trailer, uh, uh, knows that you can be both thankful for the DMV and all the things, the great things that they do, and you know, and for you know, the, you know, the transportation roads and stuff that they provide, and the rules of the road, and so on. And yet, and so that yeah, government fixes that problem. And yet, at the same time, in the midst of filling out all the forms or standing in line down at the D DMV, you can also be thinking the government is the problem. So. Both political parties are often at their best in opposition, but I would say particularly the Republicans because they tend to be the Republican. They're the party of no. They're the party of slow down. They're the party of how much is this going to cost? They're, are you sure this is a good idea? Are you you know let's not fix something if it isn't broken? Um, uh, they're they're conservative. They're cautious. You know they're 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 the they're the they're the bad cop party, um, and um, uh, so. When they were, and when I was writing Republican Party Reptile, Republicans were pretty much were in opposition. Um, certainly, um, I think Reagan was in office, but Congress was was pretty much in the hands of uh, of the Democrats. And so I was probably a little bit more buoyant about possibility. Then, of course, when Republicans get a chance to be in charge, they screw it all up. <laughs> All right, folks, any more questions? We still have another five, five, ten minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Philip. How comes conservatives like you, National Review conservatives, conservatives who were writing in magazines that have gone bankrupt, don't back Trump? Here we have one of the most effective conservative leaders in the last, since Reagan and the establishment conservative uh, thinkers or establishment do not back Trump. Yeah, you're right. And um, the, the problem is, I think, is uh, fundamentally Trump's character. Um, uh, is um, is off-putting to many of us and, and, and makes us worry. As I, I was say, as I was saying earlier, that it's that it isn't so much what he what he's done and, and, and or, or or the opinions that he has is that is that unpredictability of uh, uh, of his character that that it, it is somewhat alarming. On the other hand, I think that many conservatives like myself um, who are you know I'm not a, a guy, like a, I don't hate Trump voters. Um, uh, um, I remember like talking to a guy during the New Hampshire primary um, who was uh, wearing a Trump button. And um, I was saying, okay, uh, you're a Trump supporter. So, so what do you think? What do you think of Trump? And he said, well, I think he's a little out of whack. 
And I said, well, um, but you got, you're wearing a button. I mean, so you're supporting him and said, oh yeah, I'm supporting him. He said, well, you know, would you want him like at home? You know, would you want him in your house? He said, no, no, thanks. You know, I think the guy's like, yeah, I said, okay, I think he's a little Hollywood. He's a little, he's a little, little, little baked and Ed. And I said, so wait a minute, what's going on here? And he said, well, look, I'm a small businessman. I got a gas station, body shop, towing operation, uh, and we're doing well and everything is great. And, um, uh, but he said, I've got like these 30 year old gasoline tanks at the gas station and I cannot get the state permit. I can't get the local permit. I can't get the federal permit to remove these old tanks that need to go. And I can't get the, and I need to put new tanks in and I can't get the state. I can't get the local. I can't get the federal permit to do this. I got a junkyard out back. It's been a junkyard since the 1920s. Now I got an endangered New in 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 the snow tires, I he said you know I I got I I can we're we're doing well as a business I can afford to give the people who who um uh, work for me I can afford to give them health care, but you know Obamacare every time somebody gets a bright idea in Washington this stack of paper the size of a a phone book you know an old Boston phone book lands on my desk. I don't have a legal department. I don't have a human resources department. It's just me and my wife running this business and I'm a mechanic. Uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, I understand your frustration. I understand your anger. Uh, how does sending a nut job down to Washington uh, fix this? And he says, I, I don't know. He starts to laugh. He says, I don't know, but it's what they got coming. And, you know, I think to a certain extent, it was what they got coming. But, you know, now they've had what they got coming. So, um you know, I, it makes me nervous. How come it's conservative, the conservative establishment and conservative writers don't like Trump? He's conservative. Don't like his character. But what about, uh, his, what about as he may be. What about his policies? Uh, you know, a person's policies and their and their and their character are sort of two separate questions, and I think it's fun, fundamentally a question of character, Phil. All right, folks. Any last minute questions? It is eight o'clock, and we're going to start wrapping up this event. When we take one, uh, more. yeah. If we got one. All right, folks. If we don't have any questions, then I don't have any answers. <laughs> uh, I have one more question. Okay. What, in your opinion, is the least divisive thing that a conservative SCOTUS can do? Um, the le oh, the least uh, it, it is to throw things back into legislation is that, um, and, and I think, you know, uh, uh, some of our conservative justices over the years have been pretty good about this. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that the new one will be too, is that there are a lot of things that properly should be legislated. It should not be left up to the courts. To courts should basically be there to say, are, you know, are the laws being obeyed as they were written? You know, and not to be, the court shouldn't be there to make law. The legislature should make law and the court should be there to say, does this law conform to the constitution? Uh, is this law fairly applied? Uh, is this law clearly written? Um, what, you know, what actually does this law say? The, 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 the court should be referees. They should not be on the playing field. And I think so. I think that's the best thing a conservative Supreme Court could do. Yeah, I think that's really well spoken. Thank you. All right, folks, that is eight o'clock. So I'm going to wrap it up here. PJ, Rick, thank you both so, so much for joining us this evening. Um, thank please. you, Rick. <laughs> Rick is giving us a giant thumbs up right now. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for turning out. We hope to see you in the bookstore. Again, visit us online at www.toadbooks.com um, or come swing by. All three locations are open. PJ, Rick, thank you so, so much again. Oh, Have you're so welcome. Night. You're so welcome. Have a good evening. It's been a pleasure. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.